What I really want to talk about today is about who JFK really was, because I think that's the deeper cover-up that has not come out. I, I think you can probably say that most of the truth about the JFK assassination had come out by, I remember I said most, by about 1968, 1969, etc. okay? This part of the case, about who Kennedy really was, has not come out until now, 50 years later, with a couple of books which I'm going to mention, all right? So I'm only going to deal uh, with the assassination for about like less than a third of the presentation, all right? There's two cover-ups in the JFK case, one about his murder and one about who Kennedy was. And it's the second one that I think is more relevant and more important to American society today than the first one is. <clears throat> Let's deal very quickly with why I think the first uh, thing is pretty much shattered. Okay, CE 399. I was really glad that Mr. Blakey said today that he still believes in the single bullet theory, and I'm sorry he just left because he's gonna miss this. All right, the, the fulcrum, everybody knows the fulcrum of the Warren Commission report is a single bullet theory. There's no single bullet theory. Even Redlick said that there's two assassins, all right? Okay, in the FBI files, in, say for example, a great icon of the community, Tink Thompson, in his book, he says that Elmer Lee Todd's initials are on the bullet. They are not on the bullet. And you just write down those two URLs and you'll see the evidence that it's not on the bullet. Now, why is that important? Because that is the only in-transit initial of any authority, Secret Service or FBI, that is supposed to be on that bullet. So Hoover knew there were no initials on that bullet, okay, in transit. There was nothing to prove that anybody handled it from Dallas to FBI HQ. So Hoover just told a bold-faced lie and the Warren Commission swallowed it, and I don't mind saying the HSA, HSCA did. And if he was here, I'd say the same thing. They swallowed this. Nobody checked it. Okay, but it's a lie, all right? Now, here's is even worse. In Frazier's notes, which apparently the Warren Commission, the HSCA, never examined, Frazier, Robert Frazier is an FBI technician who did a lot of their ballistics works. He has written down there the stretcher bullet, which that is, arrived at 7.30. Impossible. Todd did not get the bullet till 8.50. How could Frazier have the bullet, okay, before Todd gave it to him? Okay, so in, in, in 40 years, nobody ever asked that question, okay? It's the wrong rifle, too. From the work of John Armstrong and Martha Moyer and Ray Gallagher, the rifle in evidence is not the rifle the FBI said Oswald ordered, okay? Oswald ordered a 36-inch, 5.5-pound carbine, and you can check that out on the order forms to clients. The rifle in evidence is a 40.2-inch, 7.5-pound, different classification, short rifle, all right? There were duplicate serial numbers on these rifles. Okay, the FBI lied about this, too. I see back in those days, I don't think everybody, anybody understood just what a horrible ogre J. Edgar Hoover was, okay? And, and, the, uh, and this case helped shatter that image. Like Bill Turner, the former FBI agent said, you know, the beginning of the end for Hoover was his investigation of the JFK case. It's the wrong brain, too. Okay, John Stringer, the official autopsy photographer, denied under oath to ARB that he took the photos that are supposed to be Kennedy's brain at NARA. And it's, this is not from memory. He never used that kind of film, and he never used that kind of a process. Okay? So who took them? And why do they need somebody else to do it? See, those questions never came up in either the Warren Commission or the HSCA because this kind of evidence never came into play. <clears throat> See, this case with you know, somebody like Eddie Lopez as Oswald's defense lawyer, th this would not even get beyond a preliminary hearing. You would just blow it right out of the water at that stage. Anybody but Jerry Spence. Anybody but Jerry Spence. All right. Where was Oswald during the shooting? This has been a long debate about this, too. Was he on the first floor? 
Is there photographic evidence of this? This is the work of a researcher named Sean Murphy. Look at the guy in red. And then look at the guy who's standing next to him. It's Wesley Frazier. All right? Now, Wesley Frazier always denied that Love Lady, okay, that that was Love Lady in the Alkins photograph. Okay, my friend Al Rossi, who helped me put this together, showed Frazier this photo today, and he says, I can't really tell because the photo's too blurry who that guy is. Well, to this day, nobody knows who it is. It just might be Oswald. This is about 30 seconds after the assassination. Now, if this is true, if that's true, then the Baker Truly Oswald meeting never happened. On the soda machine on the second floor, you know that scene is made immortal by Gary Oldman gulping the coke with Miriam Baker. Okay, I don't believe it happened. All right, has anybody here seen Baker's first day affidavit? Anybody? This is his first day affidavit. There is no mention of any soda machine in his first day affidavit. There's no mention of that cafeteria in his first day affidavit. He says he encountered the guy on the, on the stairwell between the third and fourth floor. And you want to know what the icing on the cake of this one is? It couldn't get any better. You couldn't make this stuff up. That's what's so great about this case. You can never waste your imagination because everything gets worse. Yeah. Okay? Oswald was sitting right opposite him in the witness room when he wrote the affidavit. So he forgot, oh, that's the guy who stuck the gun in his stomach, okay, because I thought he was part of the assassination plot. I don't buy it. I, that kind of stuff doesn't happen in the real world, all right? But this is the Kennedy assassination. It's not the real world. As, as Gary Cornwall said, forget about reality. <laughs> reality is irrelevant. <laughs> okay. For years, the critics argued about the length of the alleged bag Oswald carried to work that day. You know, everybody says, oh, it's two points, it's, it's, it's three points, it's three foot four. Okay, and then Dan Rather gets on TV and he goes, we'll see if the thing was up here, okay. <laughs> this information did not come from Oswald. He never said that, okay. It came from Wesley Frazier and Lenny Randall. And the first generation of critics bought this. And so they argued about, well, how long could it have been? All right, this is in, this, the beauty of this is it's right in the Warren Commission volumes, all right. This is, this is where they say his car was. This is where Linny was looking at the kitchen window. Okay, now let me ask you. Unless Linny Randall had 190 degree peripheral vision, how could she possibly see Oswald go to the back door and, and put that bag in the door lock? But it gets even worse because the FBI knew there was a problem with this story. So you know what they did? They staged this photograph. I'm leaning, not looking at the window, but looking through the door. <laughs> okay? But if you read her testimony, she never says that. She never says that she opened the door. And but it gets even worse. See, you couldn't make this stuff up. You know, I could get paid so much money in SNL putting this stuff in there. You know, I got... <laughs> okay? All right, now here it is. Here's the capper. So what do they do? They move the car inside. They moved the car inside the carport when it was on the opposite side. So they don't have to answer the question, how could she see through those slats? All right? So see, what I'm saying is the FBI knew this was bullshit all the way along. Okay? Now here's what happened, Albert. I don't know. Your power went out. Hey, how many problems to close? Okay. We'll fix it. Don't worry. It's a beautiful picture. <laughs> That's the Manessa handschrift, uh, the Manessa manuscript from the 14th century Germany. There you go. The CIA was stopping that. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so we got to get back through. Apparently, they stopped at the 14th century. Uh, let's see. Okay. So we need to go back to where you were. Tell him about the picture in the background while he's flipping through. Which picture? The Kennedy on the phone. Oh, okay. oh we're yeah, going to yeah, get yeah. to that. Oh, yeah, we're yeah. going to get to okay. that. So we, we were where? We were at uh, Lenny Mae Randall. Oh, that's right. That's right. All right. Tim, you forgot the wrong autopsy report, too. <laughs> yeah. I could have thrown that in there. Oh, okay, we were on okay. Fraser's. Okay, now, the, this, is, this is incredible. This is HSCA Moriarty, who's a pretty good detective. 
is questioning Frazier about the bag going into the, the car. And he says, but didn't you tell me that you locked every one of those doors at night before you went to bed? And he goes, well, there was a problem with that one door. <laughs> that door wouldn't lock, okay, no matter what you did. And so Moriarty just goes ahead and throws up his arms and says, you figure that one out, okay? <laughs> all right, so now we have the magic lock, all right? <laughs> now, let's go to a neutral witness because does everybody know that Wesley Frazier was, took a polygraph test at midnight the night of the assassination because he, he, they arrested him and he had a 303 Enfield rifle, which was the first rifle that was reported used in the Kennedy assassination. And he was so hysterical they couldn't get a reading on that polygraph test, all right? And on top of that, that polygraph test has disappeared from the face of the earth. Nobody can find it, all right? He doesn't know where it is either, all right? This is his mom. FBI interviews her. I never saw his old bag that day. And Doherty, of course, the guy who saw Oswald come in to the front door of the Texas school, never saw a bag that day, all right? So what I'm saying is, from our vantage point today, you know, th this whole thing has been exposed, you know, and I, I agree with Vince Salandria now. It was designed to fall apart. It was designed to fall apart and keep us running in this crazy debate you know, about bags and the single bullet theory and all this stuff to avoid the bigger picture. Okay, the single bullet theory, could Oswald run down the stairs fast enough to be drinking a Coke? How long was the bag? You know, with the work of these new writers plus Baker's affidavit, it, it's, it now exposes a bunch of dogs chasing their tails, all right? So as much as I admire these people, Mark Lane and Sylvia Marr and Harold Weisberg and Popkin and Thompson, in my opinion, they didn't go far enough. Okay, and we've been playing catch up for all these years, all right? And there is, in those early books, and in the Warren Commission, of course, there's no political aspect to this case. How select and many is a little bit better, okay, because they at least got into the Cuba angle, all right? So, in my opinion, the deeper, more pervasive, and more pernicious part of the cover-up about Kennedy's assassination and which the MSM keeps on even tighter than this one with people like Richard Reeves and Dalek and Chris Matthews and Parmit and Caro, okay, all right, is about who John F. Kennedy really was and what his foreign policy really was, all right? And even writers in this field, I'm sorry Kaiser and Newman left because I'm gonna mention them, all right, okay? You know, I like these books by John and David I very much like Jim Douglas's book, JFK and the Speakable. I disagree with all three of them on their view of who John F. Kennedy was. All right? It's completely focused on Vietnam and Cuba so much that it distorts and foreshortens and shrinks him as a statesman. See, my ideas that I'm going to talk about here don't come from those books. And in fact, I wouldn't be making this speech if I had just read those books because I wouldn't know what I was talking about, really. The tagline on Douglas's book is a cold warrior turns, as if before the missile crisis, Kennedy was Eisenhower or Truman. Okay, and then the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, like St. Paul on the way to Damascus transformed him into somebody different. Okay, I could not disagree more, and the record does not support that. But the thing is, the problem is nobody's dug into that record, so nobody knows about it, okay? Kennedy's foreign policy was in place in 1961 when he was inaugurated, all right? And if you knew what that was, you would have known that he was never gonna back up the CIA Bay of Pigs failed invasion. You would have known that he was never gonna bomb during the missile crisis. You would have known that he was never gonna send troops to Vietnam in 1961. You would have known all that in advance, all right? And you could have predicted it. These are some of the books, this book, I discovered by accident, okay? I discovered it. Okay, she helped me discover it, okay? We were in a bookstore in San Diego, you know, Mr. Lisa Peace, okay? And so, <laughs> okay, and so, and so she goes, Jim, look at that book. And I, I had never seen this picture of Kennedy before. Besides Lisa, does anybody know what that picture is? When it was taken? 
Right. This is the death of Patrice Lumumba. This is Kennedy in the White House when he gets the news that Lumumba is dead. Now, I talked to the photographer, Jacques Lowe, okay, and I said, how did that happen? And he goes, well, I was just there taking some press photographs, you know, of him at his desk signing stuff, him, you know, like, uh, you know, answering the phone and then playing with his kid, and all of a sudden the phone rang for real, okay? And I said, oh, great, I got a phone. this is a real photograph. And this is what happened, okay? Okay, now, why is that such an important, the picture's worth a thousand words, this is worth a million words. Because, and anybody ever tells you there was no difference between JFK and Eisenhower, or JFK and Johnson, just tell them you don't know what you're talking about, you never saw that picture. Eisenhower ordered Lumumba's death, okay? So if he would've got that phone call, he would've been high-fiving Alan Dulles. Hey, we got him, all right? Johnson, after Kennedy's assassinated, completely changes Kennedy's foreign policy, sends in the CIA and all these Cuban exiles with jet fighters, and they essentially eliminate the last of Lumumba's followers. So whenever some idiot like Noam Chomsky tells you that there was no difference between Eisenhower and Kennedy and Johnson, that's just a bunch of bullshit. That's just bamboozlement, all right? This book, a very good book about his Africa policy, all right, and this book, which is about the entire third world, the difference between Kennedy and Johnson in the third world. Okay, if you haven't read these books, you really don't know who JFK was. Harrison Livingston is never gonna tell you who JFK was. All right, like I said, Mahoney's book, I'll never forget the night I read it because I'd only felt like that twice in my life. You know, I've been on this case since about 25 years. I only felt like this when, number one, when I read Phil Melanson's book, Spy Saga, because that kind of cracked open the mystery of Oswald for me, okay? And when I read Jim Garrison's interview in Playboy, because that showed me that there was an alternative to the crime, okay? And this is the third time it happened. That's how influential that book was in my thinking. Okay, why do I say that Kennedy's foreign policy was formed by 1961? Because he met a certain guy many years before he became president. How bad is the research community on this subject? This guy's name was never in any book until the Douglas book, all right, which is 2008, okay, which is astonishing because if you ask me, if Kennedy would have never met this guy, he would have never been assassinated, all right, it's this guy, Edmund Gullion, all right, and I'll bet you 95% of you people never heard of him before right now, all right, and I'm not trying to show a smarter hand, I'm just trying to show how backward the research community has been in certain fields. Okay, Goulion joined the State Department in the late 1930s. He was transferred to Marseille, France in the 1940s where he acquired the French language. He was therefore then transferred to Indochina when France tried to go back and, and retake their colonial empire. All right, he had met Kennedy very briefly in the late 1940s. All right, so young John Kennedy in 1951 flies into Saigon and he decides to meet some of the, dip the diplomats and the CIA guys and the reporters there because he wants to know, you know, are we gonna win this war? Are we gonna win this colonial struggle? So he meets with Golion. Golion tells him France will never win this war in Vietnam. It ain't gonna happen, all right? Ho Chi Minh had inspired the Viet Minh, which were the colonial, anti-colonial fighters before the Viet Cong, that they would rather die than go back under the yoke of colonialism, all right? France could never win a war of attrition like that, all right? Because the home front would never support it. And Kennedy never forgot this last one, okay? Because he understood when he was in the office in 1961, if the French ain't gonna win it, we're not gonna win it either, all right? And we're gonna tear apart this country, you know, trying to win it. So that's why he said, you know, how do you fight an enemy that, that is everywhere and nowhere and has the support of the people. That was one of his arguments against all these guys in the cabinet who wanted to send these combat troops in in 1961. All right, now, one of the great things about JFK is that he never forgot the guys who really he liked coming up because when he becomes president, Goulion comes into the White House. All right, that's why there are pictures there. Oh, let me say this before I forget. It was never Kennedy's idea to send Lodge to Vietnam in the fall of 1963. He is gonna send Goulion, all right? Rusk overruled it, 
All right, he said, okay, I'm going to stuff it in your face. We'll send this crazy nut launch. Okay, so, all right. Now, Gullion becomes a point man on the Congo struggle, which actually began before Kennedy and continued after his assassination. And this episode, I believe, is disgracefully ignored. Why is it important? Because it shows Gullion's immense influence on Kennedy. Because Kennedy was determined not to let Belgium or England back into the Congo. He was determined to make Congo a free nation and in control of its own resources. All right, that's why he would have backed Lumumba. And by the way, in my opinion, and the opinion of a couple other people, the CIA killed Lumumba right before Kennedy was inaugurated for that specific purpose. They did not want him around when Kennedy was in office. All right? And most of all, he wanted to keep Katanga from splitting off from the rest of the Congo. Because once they understood that Congo was going to be a free nation, they said, OK, let's at least split off Katanga and we'll make that our vassal state because that's where all the great natural resources are. All right? Kennedy did not want to do that. He wanted to keep the riches of Katanga for the Congolese people. All right? All three protagonists in this fight for Congo's freedom are murdered by 1963. Patrice Lumumba, murdered by the Belgians with the help of the CIA in 1961. And I know Lisa's going to object to this next one. Dag Hammarskjöld, murdered by the, likely by the Belgians in a fake plan crash. She's going to say with the help of the CIA. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. And John F. Kennedy murdered by the CIA and its allies, including the mob in 1963. Now, why are those three murders so important? Because once they were completed, Kennedy's policy was completely reversed. See, this, this pattern that we all talk about, Vietnam and Cuba, you have to understand, and, and we're never going to get any place unless we understand this, it wasn't just Vietnam and Cuba. I'm going to go through about three different, it's still happening all over the world. Okay? It wasn't just Vietnam and Cuba. All right? The CIA takes over the American embassy, and they start a secret air war to eliminate the last, and they use the Cuban exiles as their pilots, by the way. All right? Congo becomes a vassal state to Belgium and England, and the riches of Katanga go, do not go to the Congolese people. All right? They went to Mobutu and his imperial employers. All right? All right, now... The exact same pattern occurs in Indonesia. With Congo, Alan Dulles and Eisenhower approved a assassination plot to murder Lumumba. In Indonesia, Eisenhower and the Dulles brothers approved a coup attempt to overthrow Sukarno, who was the leftist uh, democratic leader and the revolutionary leader who helped free Indonesia uh, from the Netherlands in 1947. When Kennedy becomes president, he asks for a report on that CIA coup attempt. Alan Dulles gives him a redacted version of the report. Okay, who do you think you are, the president or something? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but once he read it, there was enough there that Kennedy said, no, no wonder Sukarno doesn't like us. We tried to overthrow his government. Kennedy was determined to make an alliance with the leftist Sukarno. He assigned RFK and Ellsworth Bunker to negotiate the return of West Irian to Indonesia from the Netherlands. The key point about that, that is even richer than Katanga. It had a mountain in it which was called Copper Mountain. A company named Freeport Sulphur has said there's probably billions upon billions of dollars of copper, gold, and silver in this. It's pure, it's, it's like... It's the largest gold mine. Right, okay, all right. And so, again, Kennedy wanted that to go to the people of Indonesia, all right. Just to give this is one example. And by the way, that year I took for those figures is 2006. That's 40 years later. That's how much money is coming out of that one mine in Indonesia. So just go ahead and do the math. So the familiar pattern repeats itself. All right? After Kennedy befriends a third world leader and promises to visit his homeland, the CNLBJ reversed that policy with disastrous results for the native population. Within 18 months of Kennedy's assassination, the CIA plots to overthrow Sukarno and more importantly, to decimate the PKI, because that was his base in Indonesia. And they knew without that base, he could never return to power. This is the, probably the bloodiest CIA coup in history. And nobody, to this day, nobody knows how many people, I 
that's a middle figure. You'll see figures from 250,000 all the way up to half a million people. It got so bad that the rivers, like in the movies, turned red with blood. Okay? That's how many people died in that overthrow. And by the way, the CIA was so proud of that coup, all right, that it became the model for what they were going to do in the future because nobody suspected them at the beginning. All right? And it's rumored, I'm not sure about this, but it's rumored that David Phillips was part of this operation. All right? Okay, now all this showing Guglion's influence is important, but it's ignored. But I think for today's world, the most relevant thing is Kennedy's Middle East policy, which I'm sure nobody even knew, knew about this, okay? All right? He did have such a policy, and he built it, as usual, in opposition to Dulles and Eisenhower. And by the way, this was not a spur-of-the-moment thing. This was something that Kennedy had thought out in advance. Because he told, I think, Schlesinger during the Democratic Convention, you know, i got to win this thing because if Symington gets it or Johnson gets it, it's going to be the same old Dulles foreign policy. It's going to be that Cold War stuff all the way down the line. So we got to win this thing, all right? <clears throat> John Foster Dulles had killed the relationship with Nasser of Egypt, all right? He decided to back the monarchy in Saudi Arabia against Nasser. Now, the important thing about Nasser is that he's a socialist. Okay, and he's a pan-Arabist. All right, in other words, he wants all the Arab countries to get together into some kind of loose union. All right. Kennedy reversed his policy, and this is what's kind of incredible. Saudi Arabia and Egypt knocked heads over the Yemen civil war. And Saudi Arabia wanted to maintain the monarchy. So they sent in troops. Nasser did not want to maintain the monarchy. He sent in troops. Kennedy backed Nasser in that dispute. Okay, be, why? Because he perceived Nasser and Sadat as the best hopes of harnessing Arab nationalism in a direction of progress and democracy. After Kennedy was killed, Nasser sunk into a month-long depression, and he actually showed Kennedy's funeral on Egyptian national TV four times. Wow. All right? <clears throat> he also opposed a Dulles intervention in Lebanon to back a pro-Christian leader. All right, and he commissioned a, a State Department study of what it would cost to bring Mossadegh back. Now, Mossadegh, of course, was deposed by the CIA, all right, and he was another nationalist and a socialist. Okay, he wanted that, all that oil in Iran to go to the people in Iran <laughs> instead of the British Petroleum country, all right? Now, this policy stems all the way back to 1957 in a much ignored speech about Algeria. This is what Kennedy said. And I, I didn't understand this passage. I've read this speech four times. You know, and I didn't understand this passage until the last time I read the speech. Okay? See, what he's talking about here, see, Algeria was a Muslim country. It was like 80% Muslim because the Ottoman Empire had swept through northern Africa in the Middle Ages. All right? So what he's talking about here is if we can win their trust and we can pull them in a western direction, we can avoid Arab feudalism and fanatics. So he's predicting mm -hmm. what's underneath the surface is, and is not handled correctly. All right? All right. <clears throat> so this is, this is his, his Middle East policy. He's going to try and establish these moderate Arab nationalist leaders. He's not going to have anything to do with selling atomic weapons to Israel because he sees that as being escalatory and threatening. All right. Opposed to the monarchies of King Saud and the Shah of Iran in Saudi Arabia and Iran. And these two last reversals, okay, towards Israel and towards those monarchies are what have left us in this situation today. The Kennedy brothers were very dissatisfied with the Shah. As with Saud, they saw his monarchy as being out of touch with the masses too cronyish, too opposed to civil rights. And the Shah knew that this study about Mossadegh was not mere talk. So in 1963, he tries to please the Kennedys by launching a reform movement, and I'll bet you nobody ever heard of this before, called the White Revolution. All right, under pressure, he decides to give land to the peasants, okay, and grant more rights to women, all right? But as James Bill notes in his really good book, The Eagle and the Lion, and I have to give Larry Hancock credit for this because he pointed this book out to me. 
The pressure on the Shah was greatly lessened by Johnson and especially Nixon and Carter. Why? Because all three of those presidents had connections to the Rockefellers who were very much invested in the Shah's survival by any means. All right, this is, LBJ was very close to Nelson Rockefeller. Henry, I'm sure everybody knows, Kissinger owed his career to David Rockefeller, as did his big new Brzezinski, Carter's national security. But everybody knows, by the way, Carter was actually in Iran two months before the revolution. That's how stupid Brzezinski was, you know, about whose side we're supposed to be on there. Okay, JFK never cared for Rockefeller's globalist designs. But there's no doubt that Alan Dulles and McCloy were Rockefeller disciples. It was not Jimmy Carter's decision to let the Shah in the United States. Does everybody understand that? David Rockefeller commissioned John McCloy to be a one-man lobbying effort to convince Carter to bring the Shah into America. And so McCloy was absolutely incessant. And he picked off these guys, Vance, Warnke, Brzezinski, Ma even Mondale, one by one, until he turned them around and Carter's left alone in the corner with nowhere to go to. And you know what he actually said before he caved? He said, okay, but what are you guys gonna do when they take over our embassy and take our employees hostage? <laughs> he actually said that. Truer words are never spoken, all right? <coughs> Now, there was a preview of this, if anybody was looking, in 1964. In the fall of 63, David Rockefeller wanted to meet with JFK about overthrowing the government of Brazil. Kennedy refused to take that meeting because he knew what Rockefeller wanted to talk about. All right? Johnson did take that meeting one month later. All right? This was his Christmas present to Brazil. All right? And the coup in Brazil starts in spring of 1964, and the point man was John McCloy, who at that time was serving on the Warren Commission. Can anybody spell conflict of interest? Yeah. <laughs> You're carrying out this policy that the president didn't want to do, and now that he's dead, over his dead body, you're carrying out, well, you're trying to tell us who killed him? <laughs> All right, and the, the, the switching of JFK's policies in the Middle East was completed by the tilting towards Saudi Arabia, and the overall, and I'm sure everybody understands this, right? Because America today is so in love with Saudi Arabia's money, we let them get away literally murder. And so they secretly fund these terrorists, these Islamic terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda. So when the outburst of radicalism exploded in 1979 in Iran, there was no real check on that policy. All the conditions were, were there to grow and mushroom, and has it ever. See, one of the errors many of us make is we don't understand that the CIA is not really an entity unto itself. I mean, in large, in some ways it is, in some ways it is not, all right? Okay, as Donald Gibson has noted, when the CIA was created, the two men lobbying for it hardest were Donovan and Dulles, Wild Bill Donovan and Alan Dulles. And Donovan was tied to the Morgan banking interest, and Dulles was tied to the Rockefeller banking interest. And when Dulles became director, the CIA escalated all of its overthrows and assassinations in service of the Eastern establishment because he'd come from Sullivan and Cromwell, which is a giant Wall Street law firm that represented all those corporate interests. JFK was another big mistake. He was not part of this Eastern establishment, okay? All right, Be one reason was because he always felt like an outsider because he was Irish, all right? He never joined the CFR. He never joined any secret societies when he, when he was in the Ivy League. He never liked working intelligence in World War II. He asked to be, you know, I want to go out in the Pacific Ocean and float on those suicide boats with those Joe Bozo guys, all right? And then when he becomes president, he brought those guys back into the White House, all right? I want to, sh to show you dramatically what, what this means. Take, for example, his treatment of Jock Whitney. Jock Whitney was a multimillionaire who owned the New York Herald Tribune. All right, and he was very much a part of the Eastern establishment. In fact, Jock Whitney actually is a guy who allows uh, Freeport Sulphur, the huge business company that wanted into Indonesia, to make Johnson make that decision for the coup. All right, he was ambassador to England. Okay, appointed under Eisenhower. When Kennedy comes into office. He sends him a rather terse termination telegram. 
<laughs> Pretty nice way to say you're fired, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that's funny, but Jock Whitney got the ultimate revenge. The night of the assassination, Jock Whitney, if you can believe it, his official biographer says he went, he was forced into work as a copy editor at the New York Herald Tribune. <laughs> Here's this guy worth $800 million, which is about almost $4 billion today, and he had to go in. He couldn't hire anybody else. They didn't want to pay anybody overtime. You know, he went in as a copy editor at the New York Herald Tribune, and that was the first paper that got out this story about Oswald as a sociopath. All right? Okay, I go on and on, you know, Laos, Dominican Republic, et cetera. But the main point is that when we limit ourselves to just Cuba and Vietnam, we miss this much bigger picture. Okay? In 1961, not 1963, JFK was enacting a policy that was constructed as early as 1951 throughout the world. All right? One of third world nationalism instead of globalism. And there were trillions of dollars on the table. Trillions. All right? My favorite quote by one of the suspects in the JFK case, Gordon Novell, he deserved to die. He was trying to change things too fast. All right, and I, where did I find that interesting? Because Gordon Novell was hanging out with Alan Dulles at this time. Okay, I'm convinced today it's this cover-up that is even more ingrained into our society than the cover-up about Kennedy's assassination because it hides a demonstrable motive for his murder. Okay, back in the 60s, one man tried to say the motive for Kennedy's murder was a coup d'etat, Jim Garrison. He was derided by his critics, for example, Ting Thompson. Well, Garrison was right, Ting Thompson was wrong, all right? When we, when we just talk about Cuba and Vietnam, not only does that get boring, but it shortchanges history, it cripples our case, and it cripples our image of who President Kennedy really was. It, with no question in my mind, as a student of history, Kennedy was the most visionary foreign policy since FDR. And there's nobody even in close second place. And that covers 60 years. All right? And in my opinion, it got him killed. Thank you. Well, first to invite Lady down here. I have to take this question first. So uh, I, I have to say that when I first started working at the um, committee, as you know, we didn't have the clearances yet, and we had to wait around. And so I felt that the only way we could find out what, why he was killed was to look at foreign policy. Mm -hmm. So I have to admit to you that in drug-induced stupors, <laughs> some nights, some nights um, I would rant on about exactly the same stuff. That you really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is why Dan said to me, um, you have to go listen to Jim's, because that's you talking back. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, and no, that, that's, that's great. That, that's, that's, what, that's great. That's what I thought. And I, I, I and Dan would say he was crazy. That's of a new, of a paranoid person. But, but and, and I would like just try to convince him that no, it, it's not. It's, it's what was going on. You got to look at at pre 1960s presidency and then what happened during it. And then I always. Say and all of this goes through history now and see what's going on in, in not not in seventy two but then later on in, in eighty five and in ninety three and, and as recently as two thousand and one. It's really great that he said that because when I first made this presentation in Pittsburgh, Danny was there. Yeah. And Danny waited until I got down from the podium. He shook my hand, Jim, that's exactly what Eddie Lopez would have done. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I just have to say that um, you know, I mean I'm I'm biased. Because that's what I thought. Uh -huh. and, and I could not do it until you do it now because it's been 35 years. But back then, that's what I was saying. Congratulations, Eddie. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Dave. And as one who read Mahoney's book early on, too, I'm fully on your side. But here's my question What advice would you give JFK today? <laughs> oh. Hey, look, if you want to do the right thing, if you want to do the right oh, thing, boy. listen to this guy. You want to stay alive? Don't listen to this guy. Don't fire Alan. That's what Obama said. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Jim, uh, fascinating presentation. Thank you. And uh, something you should see 
you do twice because there's so much information that's new. But you mentioned uh, there's a pattern here where JFK wants to keep the nationalism within each country and keep the control of the British and so forth from uh, having that over the oil supply and distribution. Yeah. Have you figured out whether that was to free up the marketplace more so the price of oil would go down worldwide? Do you think that's what was Kennedy was wanting those countries to have their no, control? No, no. Well, see, I, I cut one thing out of here because I had to change it a little bit. In 1963, Nehru from India mm -hmm. was trying to lecture Kennedy on the evils of colonialism. Mm -hmm. And Kennedy got really kind of upset and he said words to the effect, you know something, I grew up in a country that knew the worse colonialism than you did. And this went on for 800 years. So I know exactly what the hell you're talking about. I mean, he, was, he was talking about being Irish. Okay, so that's how deeply ingrained, and that's why I believe that Goulion's message stuck home with him. Okay, that he felt like that, a part of him, because he's an Irish Catholic. Okay, he kind of felt like that himself, you know? So that, that's why I think the motive was be, be, behind this. Hey John, this is a question. Oh, let me add one last thing. See, there's a, like I said before, there's a lot of people who get successful and they forget where they came from. Okay, and then there's some people who get successful and they never forget where they came from. Okay, and he was one of the guys who never forgot where he came from. All right? Now, here's a question that you may have been asked. Of course, Kennedy ran on the notion that we were behind the Russians, the missile gap, right. mm -hmm. and was critical of the fact that we were not aggressive enough on Cuba. Mm -hmm. Right. So he was he was Hostage. actually trying to run to the right of yeah. right mm -hmm. of Nixon yeah. of Nixon. So what? How do you reckon? Okay, let me explain that to you. The right. strategy behind that. And well, the, and then, and then the mob probably gave him money because he was saying that, and then all of a sudden it's reversal of position. But I think they already knew he, is, he had lots of perspective because of the fact that he spoke out on being in the right. But how do you reconcile that? Okay, well, I've been asked that question before. Yeah. Okay, there's two ways I reconcile it. Okay. okay, number one, I believe that that stuff in the debates was stagecraft. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't believe mm -hmm. he, I just to get a lot that he, so was he, he was kind of play acting. Okay. Okay, to, so it's not. He, was being, he wasn't being honest in this respect. Right. I, that's, well, sometimes you yeah, get elected in this politics. country, you've got to do that stuff. Okay? And then once he came into office, and this is in a really good book that, again, nobody's probably read Mike Swanson's book, The War State. Once he gets into office, you know, he actually sees his stuff and he goes, holy shit, we're way ahead of those guys. And he actually, he actually ordered one of his guys to make a speech about the Russians saying, look, there's no point trying to compete with us because we're way too far ahead of you. All right? Okay? So he was kind of deceived and he was a little bit, you know, play acting and get elected. That's how I explain that. Because once he gets into office, it's completely different. He realizes the advantage was the United States. Right. And if you look at the building of atomic weapons, the, by far the biggest buildup is under Eisenhower. Because Dulles convinced him that it's cheaper to build nukes than it is to fashion divisions. Right. All right. Uh, this one, one, one more point about the argument that was made by Stone, the guy that's pushing the LBJ being the primary suspect. Roger Stone? Roger yeah. Stone. He makes an argument that I dispute that the fact that we actually gave up more on the Cuban Missile Crisis, that Kennedy gave up a lot more than we got. Kennedy what? Gave up, gave gave up, up more by, by The military? No, by, the by, Saturn, you know, by giving up the missiles in Turkey that we, they, that we gave. Oh, oh more I see what you mean. That yeah. us, the Russians got the better deal. The Soviets got the better deal. And I think I can't dispute that because obviously the, the Soviets have to contend with a disadvantage, strategic no, I, disadvantage. You know, I don't agree with that. And I mean, do you know what Khrushchev had planned to move into Cuba? Do you know? It's 101 missiles, you know, 60 medium, four, over 40 long range. Every major city in the United States could have been hit. On top of that, that's not it. On top of that, it was 12 nuclear submarines. All right, and on top of that, it was 25 beef backfire bombers that could deliver, and there was no warning because it's only 90 miles away from Florida. So Khrushchev would have had a first strike against the United States. So I don't think that Kennedy gave up. I, that stuff was useless because he moved the Polaris missiles in. And in fact, when he, when he said, wait a minute, we still have those missiles in Turkey? He goes, I thought we were going to move the Polaris in there already. All right? So I don't think, I don't think Kennedy gave up more than Khrushchev. I think Khrushchev gave up a lot more. The one thing he did get, though, Okay, was a pledge not to invade Cuba. Yeah, right. That's okay. the one. Last question. Last, Last question. question. Well, it's not really a question, it's just to point something out. Um, 
that you didn't mention, it's kind of a footnote. Um, we've heard a lot about the American empire and all the bases that we have all over the world. I never heard of any president except Kennedy that started closing bases. And I remember that very specifically because I was on one. And, and, if, and if he hadn't done that, I probably wouldn't be here. I'd have gone, I could have gotten discharged over there in Spain, and I would have headed straight for Amsterdam, because even before marijuana, that was the party capital of Europe. <laughs> and I would have been 20 years old, 22 maybe, and I would have stayed there, because I got a charge out of the Europeans that I met. So I was really kind of heartbroken that our base was closed, and I know a lot of other ones were too, but nobody's done that since. Oh, be before we break, I guess we're getting kicked out here, one last thing that this gentleman always brings up. Did you know that in September of 1963, Kennedy went to the UN and asked for a joint mission to the moon yes. between Russia and the United States? It's true. Yeah. You know, I always thought that was mythology, but it's true. It's like this stuff that you can't believe that ends up being the truth and that they bury under this other image of Kennedy, you know? So, but anyway, so we'll, we'll close with that. Thanks, Chris. <laughs>